balcony to start the recorder, and then the Mad Dash into the sound room to start the CD and the cassette tape. And uh, that's why I always appreciate it when the hymn is a little bit slower right before the message when I have to make that Mad Dash. So tonight, our uh, lesson is Acts chapter 13, verses 30 through 37, the resurrection of Christ and prophecy. Last week, of course, we saw how God-haters actually fulfill Bible prophecy as we were looking at the crucifixion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, the betrayal, the events leading up to the cross, a very important group of Old Testament prophetic scriptures that we saw last week. And tonight, we want to look at what follows that, which is, of course, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at verses 27 through 29. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Fulfilling Bible prophecy and not even realizing that you are doing it. Some fantastic things are given to us in those three verses that we looked at last week. The Bible doctrines of predestination and reprobation are clearly seen in that text. And we saw that the definition of predestination is the determining of the final destiny of men and angels before they were ever created, and that includes reprobation of some. We learn four different things from those three verses. Number one, the Jews of Jerusalem and the Jewish leaders did not recognize Christ when he came, even though they read the Bible constantly. And there are people in churches, and even in this church, who read the Bible through in a year, but perhaps do not understand it. Those leaders were spiritually blind and spiritually dead. They were not saved, even though they were reading the Bible. The second thing we saw was that they fulfilled the prophecies that said that they themselves would condemn him and crucify him. They knew what the Bible said intellectually, but they hadn't put it together with what they themselves were doing. How many of us read the Bible and never apply it to our own lives? The third thing it says that they knew was that they knew he was innocent. Quote, they found no cause of death in him but they still wanted him killed. The motives of the flesh are very powerful, and for an unsaved man, much more powerful than even what he reads in the Word of God. And finally, they got the Gentiles involved in the murder because God had predestined Gentiles as well as Jews, and Christ was going to die for Gentiles as well as Jews, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. We talked about what was spiritual blindness, because that's very key to that passage. Spiritual blindness as particularly manifested by the Jews. So what is spiritual blindness in the context of prophecy? We saw this, the answer. They clearly were not trying to fulfill Bible prophecy and thereby send themselves to hell. I think if they had understood that, they definitely would not have done what they did. The Bible tells us that spiritual blindness has two prongs. First, it is the result of being spiritually dead. Dead men are blind. And number two, it's the result of the active work of Satan to keep us in that state. That has the practical results of spiritual blindness in that they, and sometimes we, have no idea that we may be fulfilling Bible prophecy. And we saw many passages of Scripture quoting the Gospels and quoting our Lord Jesus Christ on the issue of spiritual blindness. We saw Paul ties Satan to spiritual blindness in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And then we saw what was perhaps the key passage, the key doctrinal passage explaining it in 1 Corinthians 2.8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's a passage that gives us an insight into what might have been. And God has only given us a few things 
in Scripture where he pulls aside the veil, and we looked at a few of those, and lets us know what would have been if something else had been different, and that is one of them, which none of the princes of this world do, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If Satan knew that the cross was his crushing defeat, he would never have moved the Jews to crucify Christ. If the Jews really knew who Jesus was, they would not have crucified him. We saw that Jesus gave the illustration of some cities that were cursed, and if Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah had, had, had Christ do the miracles in those cities, they would have remained, but Chorazin did not, Bethsaida did not, Capernaum did not. We saw the second thing, that even though they had a head knowledge of the Bible, they didn't understand the prophecies related to Christ. So many of us in so-called Reformed churches ignore prophecy. The majority of Reformed churches are amillennial. That means they do not take prophecy literally, and they do not, therefore, take it seriously. That is a very serious issue. I praise God, the Bible Presbyterians are premillennial and pre-tribulational, and they take prophecy literally, and they take it seriously. But even we aren't always attuned to how the prophetic scriptures relate to us today. Not always are we aware of what God is doing in the world so that he might bring the final prophecies of history to their culmination. Oh, we see the generally bad things that are going on in the world around us. We complain about our government and the things that they seem to be doing that are totally contrary to the Constitution. But do you understand it in light of prophecy? What God is doing in the nation of Israel. What God is doing with the European Union. What God is doing in the countries of Africa. What God is doing in India and Muslim countries what God is doing in South America in relation to prophecy, what God is doing in the United States to make us no longer a great nation, but a weak nation that is not even mentioned in prophecy. We need to understand the prophetic scriptures if we would be true to Christ. That's the point that's being made here in these passages, and we looked at a good number of passages that dealt with prophecy concerning the first coming of Christ. We looked at a good number of passages dealing with reprobation, including the fact that Judas was chosen to be reprobate. He was chosen to be the one who would betray Christ, and that a special place in hell was prepared for Judas, who was chosen to fill that slot. That's difficult for us sometimes to see. We saw that the test of reprobation is looking to see if your profession of faith has any fruit in it. Jesus said, And now is the axe laid to the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And you all know the remainder of that passage, how Jesus says that every tree is, that is good brings forth good fruit, and the corrupt tree brings forth corrupt fruit. So one of the clear proofs of election is fruit-bearing. John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, that's election, and ordained you that you should do three things. Number one, go. Number two, bring forth fruit. Number three, that your fruit should remain. Those who are elect, those who have been chosen, those who have been ordained, will go, that is, they will obey, and they will bring forth fruit, and it will be lasting fruit. That's one of the main tests concerning whether or not you are among the elect. You can look at yourself and say, am I among the elect or am I reprobate? We saw one of the most important lessons that Paul gave us on that subject in Romans 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that is Christ, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. A marriage brings forth fruit. Now, what is the lesson? And we need to hear it well. Law-keeping is not the same thing as fruit-bearing, because he gives the contrast here with the law, which was dead and bore no fruit, 
with being married to Christ, which is part of the bride of Christ, and bearing fruit. The kind of fruit that God produces in the life of the believer is the fruit that he himself has predestinated, the fruit that he himself produces in the life of the believer, that is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Interesting. Again, the contrast with law. Law-keeping is not the same as fruit-bearing. Ephesians 5.9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. We saw how God accomplishes that predestinated fruit. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So how can you be a fruit inspector? How can you know what is phony and what is real? It can be summarized in two points. Number one, fruit bearing always reflects the ninefold character of Christ, which is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. If you examine the life of Christ, he perfectly exemplifies every one of the fruit of the Spirit. That is the character of Christ. And number two, fruit bearing results in goodness, righteousness, and truth. That was the verse we read in Ephesians 5.9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. It always results in goodness, righteousness, and truth. That is how we can tell who the apostates are, that is the false teachers, because they are morally defective, they are full of lust, covetousness, they are liars and evil, and there is no spiritual fruit in their lives. I'm just going to read you a few verses. We did not cover these last week, but it gives us the background for what we want to talk about tonight. Some verses from Jude and 2 Peter. These are just a few scattered verses. You can read the whole epistles to deal with the issue of how can you know who an apostate is. Jude 1, beginning in verse 4, and then I'll jump down verses. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Okay, ordained to this condemnation. What do we have? Reprobation. God chose them to be condemned. They are ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is shameless immorality. It's like the hippies in the 70s who lay nude on the beach and fornicated on top of their multicolored painted Volkswagen vans. That's lasciviousness. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Sodomy, which we see spreading across our country today. And there are those who, standing in pulpits, claim to be ministers of the gospel, who give the nod of approval to that kind of lifestyle. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. They hate authority, that is, and speak evil of dignities. Jumping down a few more verses. These are spots in your feasts of charity. They show up for church dinners. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water. A cloud promises that there's going to be some refreshment coming. But these are clouds without water, carried about of winds. And Paul speaks of the winds of doctrine. Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit. They do not have the character of Christ, the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. Their lifestyle does not result in goodness and righteousness and truth. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Listen to their mouth. who will tell you whether or not you have someone who is bearing the fruit of the Spirit or have someone who is walking in the flesh. Second Peter, chapter 2. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, their damnation slumbereth not, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Walking after the flesh, what do they pursue? They may look good on Sunday, what do they pursue the rest of the week? What do they pursue even while they're in church? Because it tells us this about them. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime 
they don't even just wait till night, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery. Watch their eyes. They lust after the women and the girls in the church. There they are, eating your agape feasts with you. Busy checking out who they're going to try to hit next. In the sovereign plan of God, individuals are chosen for damnation as well as for heaven. And we saw that in 2 Peter, verse 8 also. It says, These are the people who stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. And that's contrasted with our election in the very next two verses. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and so on. We saw those extra prophecies concerning Judas and how he was specifically chosen for reprobation and did precisely what the scripture said he would. And then we saw many other prophecies that the reprobate Jewish leaders and pagan Gentiles fulfilled concerning the betrayal, crucifixion, and death of Christ. And that's what brought us to the message for tonight. I'm going to start reading again with the two verses that relate to the death of Christ immediately preceding our passage for tonight. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. It's amazing and wonderful to see the but God passages in Scripture. But God raised him from the dead. The worst that men could do, the most horrendous act in all of history, the most vile rebellion against God, the most hateful rejection of God's love was answered by the resurrection. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we've talked a good deal about that when we were back in Acts chapter 1 and 2. And we declare unto you the glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written, and we'll talk about those in a second, but notice what Paul introduced that with. He said, we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers. God made a promise concerning the resurrection of Christ from the dead unto the fathers. In other words, this is a promise that God made in the Old Testament and had been around for generations and it was written there clearly for everyone to see and it was understandable for those who would read it and to whom God would give illumination. But it was a promise made to the fathers. The death of Christ was promised. We have seen many passages related to that. But the resurrection of Christ was also promised. And we'll be looking at those passages tonight. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. So he tells us where the first quotation is going to come from. He's going to give us two more quotations, and he doesn't tell us exactly where they are, but we can find them. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, so here's our third quotation, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he, that is speaking of Jesus, whom God raised again, saw no corruption. As you look at scripture, and I'm going to pause and put an insertion in here, the issue about what is death is very clearly answered. Modern medicine today tries to say, well, when it's either when the brain waves go flat or when the heart stops beating. The scripture tells us the life of the flesh, Leviticus 17:11, is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Corruption, that is rot and decay, starts first with the blood. The body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. At what point does the spirit leave the body? 
when the brain waves go flat? No, people have been brought back after the brain waves have gone flat. When the heart stops beating? No, people have been brought back after the heart has stopped beating. And it's very clear that it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. You don't die twice. You don't go in death, hover above your body, be really dead, as the doctors are saying he's dead, and then come back into your body again. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. At what point is the spirit separated from the body and definitely not coming back in again? It's when the corruption in the blood starts. Interesting, because Christ shed his blood for us. But the scripture clearly says in two different places here, that he is quoting, he saw no corruption. There was no rot. There was no decay. There was no disintegration of blood or tissue. His blood and body were perfectly preserved. You see, for the rest of us, death because of sin is represented by and symbolized the decay that sets in at the point of physical death. Christ bore our sins, but he himself was without sin. And so the scripture specifically prophesied that as he lay in the tomb awaiting the resurrection, he saw no corruption. And Paul makes a point of it here because he goes on to say how David, when he died, saw corruption. His body rotted. But Jesus didn't. Very important point because Christ rose from the dead, but we're going to rise from the dead someday and we will see corruption if we die before our Lord returns. We'll save that for just a moment. Something else you want to notice about these uh, verses here, that this is the one specific event in Paul's sermon on which he spends the most time. He only spends basically two and a half verses on the death of Christ in prophecy, but he spends eight verses on the resurrection. Because, you see, the resurrection is the linchpin of the Christian faith. Everything else either rises or falls on the resurrection. Without the resurrection, the death of Christ has no meaning. That's very important to understand. The death of Christ is essential, absolutely essential to our salvation. But without the resurrection, it is meaningless. Because the resurrection is what proves that the death of Christ accomplished what God said it would accomplish. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 1. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he promised before by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and we're going to see in just a moment, that Paul here in his sermon quotes a passage written by David. In fact, he quotes two passages written by David. Concerning David's seed, the one that would descend from David. Concerning the Davidic covenant, we're going to see that passage in just a second. Concerning... Christ Jesus our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Paul understood the connection. Paul makes it clear here in Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll look at in just a moment, that without the resurrection there is no hope, but with the resurrection there is the guarantee. A guarantee both of predestination to heaven and predestination to hell. The resurrection is the heart of the gospel, the good news concerning eternal salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein you stand, and by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. You see, if the resurrection isn't true, it's a vain faith. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And we know this is true, he says, because we have witnesses. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. 
magnificent witness to the resurrection of Christ. And we've talked about all the witnesses in some of our past messages. Number three, without the resurrection there is no gospel and that means there is no hope. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Do you get it? Without the resurrection, Christianity is worthless. Yea, and we're found false witnesses of God, because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be, the dead rise not. Now you think, well, you know, that would really be a, if it wasn't true, it would still be a nice thing to say about God that he did it. You know what Paul says? You'd be a false witness. False witnesses on so critical a matter. What was supposed to happen to false witnesses on such a critical matter? They were to be stoned to death. Lying about what God has done. Your people will tie that into some other things. What about preachers who stand in the pulpit and lie about what God has done concerning creation? And say God didn't really do what he said in the Bible. He used evolution to do it. Do you understand what it means to be a false witness concerning what God has done? Yea, we're found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ and he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Without the resurrection, there's no gospel. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. That's a very important thing for us to remember. And that's what Paul is dealing with here in his sermon, where he's preaching the same things that he gives us in Romans, and the same things that he gives us in 1 Corinthians. Now you remember his audience. It was in a synagogue, but there were also Gentiles in the synagogue. There were those who knew that something about the Jewish faith was different than anything they'd ever heard before. And we're going to see next week, the Lord willing, if the Lord tarries and lets us live, that there is a tremendous response among the Gentiles in that city because of what Paul is preaching about the resurrection. I don't want to give away too much, but it's a tremendous response because of what the Gentiles believed concerning when you're dead, you're dead. And the separation of body from spirit and all kinds of strange Greek ideas about it's better to not have a body and better to be sort of floating around out there and the more you become spirit and the less you become body, the better you off you are. And Paul is preaching a resurrection. And he's going to have some people who are a link in that synagogue with the rest of the Gentile community. Oh, it's exciting. We'll have to wait till next week. The resurrection of Christ is also, number four, the resurrection of Christ is also the guarantee of our resurrection, never to die again. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. That's what it says, verse 44. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening, that is, a life-giving spirit. Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot, get it, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. The resurrection of Christ is the guarantee that our, in our resurrection we will never die again. The resurrection of Christ is also the guarantee of the rapture. I hope you're beginning to sense 
why this was such a key issue to Paul and why we see so many verses spent on it here in our text in Acts chapter 13. The resurrection of Christ is the guarantee of the rapture, verses 51 and following. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. Now listen to this next phrase carefully. And the strength of sin is the law. Law keeping is not the same thing as fruit bearing. The law only condemns. That's where sin gets its power. The strength of sin is the law because it can take you and massacre you with it. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. One more thing, number six. The resurrection of Christ is the ultimate motivator for encouragement and for holy Christian living. The resurrection of Christ is the ultimate motivator for encouragement and holy Christian living. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Therefore, because the resurrection is true, therefore, because Christ is risen from the dead, therefore, because that guarantees your resurrection, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I hope you can see why Paul got such an electrifying and positive response to his message. So let's look at the prophecies now concerning the resurrection to which Paul makes reference in his sermon. Verse 32, Acts 13, we're back to now. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son... This day have I begotten thee. See, that's an interesting phrase. Why would Paul pull that phrase, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, out of Psalm 2 and tell us it's a reference to the resurrection? Did you ever wonder that? Seems like an odd phrase to speak of the resurrection. It certainly doesn't seem to be clear on the surface, but of course... A lot of those passages that we saw the apostles quoting early in the book of Acts also didn't seem to make much sense in, in connection with you know, Judas. And do those passages really refer to Judas? <laughs> and his bishopric let another take, let his habitation be desolate, his wife be a widow. The Bible says specifically that those referred to Judas. Now we need to understand that God speaking through his apostles under the power of the Holy Spirit had a reason for putting each of these phrases from the different locations in which they are found into the scriptures and we find the New Testament is explaining to us what God meant when he put those phrases in the Old Testament even though rationally it might not make the greatest deal of sense to us. But this is what God says about it. David said it in the second psalm and Paul is right. He gets it out of the second psalm. It's written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And that's connected specifically, immediately, to Jesus' resurrection, in that he has, hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So Paul tells us that the first prophet he's going to talk about is in Psalm 2, and specifically says that Psalm 2 refers to Jesus. He had raised up Jesus, as it's written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now when you look at Psalm 2, you discover that it is an incredibly important messianic psalm. And it concerns the millennial reign of Christ preceded by God judging the nations. And that's the context in which we find this verse, which happens to be verse 7. Let me read the entire psalm to you. It's a very short psalm. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? 
The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So what we have so far, getting through verse 6, is we find the world is in rebellion against God. We find God is sitting in heaven and laughing at them because they are such pipsqueaks, little ants running around on the surface of the earth that he can smush with just coughing at them. And then we get Messiah sitting on the holy hill of Zion. That's what occurs during the millennial reign of Christ. That's verse 6. We find God speaking to him in wrath and vexing him in his sore displeasure. That's what happens in the great tribulation period, right before Christ sits on Mount Zion. And then we get verse 7. I will declare the decree. Ah. So suddenly we're moving from that future picture that he gives to us in verses 1 through 6. We're moving back to the eternal decrees of God before creation, before time began. The decrees that God determined all that would happen. And which of the eternal decrees does David give to us prophetically under the direction of the Holy Spirit? Which of the decrees is the decree that guarantees what we've just seen in verses 1 through 6? It is the decree concerning the resurrection. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, so this is Jesus speaking, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That is one of the eternal decrees. And it is the decree the New Testament tells us relates to the resurrection of Christ. This day have I begotten thee. You're my son. This day have I begotten thee. You have the eternal generation of the Son from the Father, basic tenet of Christian faith. What does it relate to? The resurrection of Christ, which is the guarantee, the proof of Christ as the eternal Son of God. Verse 8, often used as a missionary verse, has nothing to do with missions. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That's the Father speaking to the Son, the Lord speaking unto me, Messiah speaking there in verse 7. And the Father says to the Son, You ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And he's not saying, so that means you can go out and win lots of souls for Christ. Because he tells you in verse 9, the very next verse, what Jesus is going to do with them. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That is not missions. Take things in context, folks. The context here is the eternal decree of God concerning the resurrection of Christ, which is the guarantee as to why he can sit on the holy hill of Zion and why he can judge the nations. It's because he's the one who has risen from the dead. We'll see it quoted that way over in Revelation chapter 1 in just a few moments. That's the context that we discover this psalm is being set in as we get to the doctrine of last things and as we get to the prophetic scriptures in the book of Revelation. And especially as we get to Revelation chapter 19, where we see Jesus smashing them with a rod of iron and breaking them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And it goes back to the fact that he is the risen lamb. He is the one who is standing, though he has been slain. Verses 10, 11, and 12. So what should we learn from this? Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Verse 12. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him, that is, in the Son. This is a psalm that deals with Jesus. This is a messianic psalm that 
sets the context around the resurrection of the final judgments that God is going to do upon the earth and the guarantee that will happen because Christ is risen from the dead. Paul's hearers certainly knew Psalm 2. After all, that was a synagogue. What they didn't know was that it referred to Jesus, and what they didn't know was that verse 7 referred to the resurrection of Christ. And you know, we probably wouldn't know that either unless the Bible had told us that Psalm 2-7 is interpreted, in fact, in multiple places, we'll see in a moment, in the New Testament, referring to the resurrection of Christ. For example, Psalm 2, quoting it, we see the resurrection is what proves that Jesus is not an angel. Hebrews 1-5, quoting Psalm 2, for under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be unto me a son. God never said that to an angel. He said it unto Jesus. Remember the Lord said unto my Lord? Remember the Father says unto the Son? We find, quoting Psalm 2 again, that it's the resurrection of Christ that began his high priestly ministry on our behalf. Hebrews 5.5 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That's quoting Psalm 2. Same passage that Peter's quoting over there, or Paul's quoting over there in Acts chapter 13. We find that that is the proof that he is the eternal creator. We see that in Colossians 1, 17 and 18. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning Get this next phrase, the firstborn from the dead. That's firstborn by resurrection. That in all things he might have the preeminence. That's why he has the preeminence. That's why we have proof that he is the eternal creator. By him all things consist. It's proof that Christ is qualified to be the final judge of all men. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 we mentioned a moment ago. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The other psalm, we're going to skip over that second quote for a moment. The other psalm that Paul quotes here is Psalm 16. Verse 35, Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up again saw no corruption. So he's making the point here that David was not talking about himself. David was talking about someone who would be his descendant who would not see corruption. Psalm 16, 8 and 9, and here we have the quotation that's being quoted by Paul in Acts 13. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth, my flesh also shall rest in hope. And I just discovered that page number 8 did not print. <laughs> so let's turn over to Psalm 16, because we'll go on from there. Psalm 16. I must have run out of paper and not realized it. Turn to Psalm 16, looking at verses 8 and 9. Again, one of the important psalms of the Old Testament, speaking of the resurrection of Christ. Other portions which speak of our resurrection, such as in the book of Job, where Job declares that he knows that in his flesh shall he see God. But we have here, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my flesh my, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy. And Paul makes the point that David saw corruption. In fact, you can go to Jerusalem today and see the tomb of David at least the traditional tomb of David. And there are David's bones still in Jerusalem, but not the bones of Jesus. My soul rejoices in hope. We find Paul refers to one other passage here as he is speaking in Acts. He says, And as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. 
That is a quotation from the book of Isaiah. And I will have to flip there since I don't have the page where it is written down. But it's Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. And verse 3. Now you all know verses 1 and 2. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. We all know those verses. Wonderful how God has provided for us. Look at verse 3, though. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. An everlasting covenant that relates to what is called the sure mercies of David. That is a quotation and a reference back to the covenant God made with David. A covenant that could not have been fulfilled unless there was a, a descendant of David who could eternally sit on David's throne. And Paul says that promise quoting here Isaiah 55, 3, is one of the proofs of the resurrection of Christ. And as concerning, this is verse 34 of Acts 13, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Paul takes that short phrase out of Isaiah 55, 3 and says, that is the guarantee that Jesus was raised from the dead and that he did not see corruption. Not merely Psalm 16, which says it clearly, but this psalm also, or excuse me, this passage from Isaiah also is one of the guarantees that Jesus saw no corruption. He says, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now let's look at the Davidic covenant for a moment. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. God gave some amazing promises to David. I had the verses summarized. Now this is quite a long promise that God gives to David here, the Davidic covenant, as we get to it. But God tells him something, and we'll begin down here in verse 12. Speaking to David, he says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Somebody who's going to be a descendant of David one who proceeds out of his bowels, one who is uh, a descendant of David. It says, verse 13, He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. For how long? Forever. Now Solomon is going to sin, and he's going to get chastened, and God says so in the next verse to David. But he promises David that he will establish the throne of David's kingdom forever. Verse 16, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. It's a rather significant promise concerning the Davidic throne. Concerning the one who would sit on the throne of David. Without the resurrection of Christ, that is impossible. That's the point that Paul's making. He's quoting passages that certainly the Jews in the synagogue would have known and would have understood. And then we find David, after Nathan tells David all these things in verse 17, we find that David goes in to speak to the Lord. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant for thy word's sake, and according to thine own heart hast thou done these great things to make thy servant to know them. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Jumping down to verse 25. 
O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. Has said. And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of thy servant David be established forever. Verse 29. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it, and with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Do you understand the point that Paul is making in Acts 13? Without the resurrection of Christ, the Davidic covenant cannot be fulfilled, and without the resurrection of Christ, there will not be someone who can sit on the throne of David forever. And he quotes Isaiah 55, 3 as the guarantee of the resurrection because of that. Is the resurrection of Christ prophesied in the Old Testament? Yes, I definitely think, <laughs> I hope at least that you've seen that tonight. And without the resurrection of Christ, there is no hope. Without the resurrection of Christ, the promises of God fall flat. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no Davidic covenant. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no guarantee of the rapture. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no guarantee of the resurrection of believers. Without the resurrection of Christ, our preaching is vain and your faith is vain also. Without the resurrection of Christ, we might as well eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's what caused the excitement when Paul finishes his sermon in Acts 13. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege we've had tonight of looking into your word. We thank you for its power. We thank you for the way in which your Holy Spirit cross-references the Old Testament into the New Testament so that we might understand these passages which you have set there. And yet there is so much more incredible, magnificent prophecy concerning that which is to come. Prophecies that we don't know because we don't study them. Because we have a theology that's already packed in ice and set on the shelf. And we think we know it all. But how much more is there in the infinite Word of God? Father, we pray that you'll take what we've studied tonight and give us a thirst, a hunger, to study the Word of God to understand day by day the connections between this scripture and that scripture and another scripture and the way that you tie them together, and the way that they are used by the old in the New Testament, uh, those Old Testament prophets. Help us to be students of prophecy so that we'll understand what's going on in the world around us. And Father, cause our hearts to rejoice because we see you're the sovereign God who has ordained all things from the beginning, that in the end you might bring the greatest amount of glory to your Son, Jesus Christ. For he is worthy. He is the risen Christ. He is the King of Israel. He is the one who is our Savior, our Redeemer, our Creator, and our God. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We sang a resurrection hymn to introduce the message, because that's what the message was about tonight. And we have another resurrection hymn, if the thing hasn't been pulled.